so welcome. Uh, this week we're going to uh, talk with Brandon Williams Craig. I'll get him to introduce himself in a second. Uh, Brandon is a longtime colleague of mine. Uh, he used to work on the board of IKEA Extensions. Uh, what was your title? Managing Director or Executive Director? It's something like that, wasn't it? Executive Director and then the board. Yeah, he was the one that made things happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he, he was the one who got paid and, and actually made things happen, whereas the rest of us sort of just turned up occasionally. Um, so I think it's fair to say that Brandon's pretty passionate about the idea that you can take out I Aikido off the mat and in into the world. Uh, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think it's also probably fair to say that he's not utterly convinced that Aikido, as we know it, in the most part, is doing very well at achieving that goal. Um, hence the formulation of Aikido 2.0. And that seems like a good point to say, Brandon, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, thank you very much first for um, inviting me to be part of this group and for using your time to attend. It is an honor to be with you all. Um, I have practiced Aikido since 1990. Um, I have a fifth Don and a PhD in psychology and founded three dojos at the University of California, Berkeley in downtown Oakland and here in North Texas. Um, I'm involved in teaching online classes graduate students of psychology, literature, and religion, um, professional adults, families, children, and I, I help leaders and teams manage and deliver projects, mostly. Um, that's probably enough about me, unless we have this, there's more questions later. I'm, I'm, I'm itching to get into the material. Um, okay, so my initial comments, any, any comments on that? Would you like to add a little? Would I like to what? Would you like to add anything to what I said initially about you sort of not being overwhelmed by the success of Aikido and taking the principles off the mat? That's fair. Yeah, I'll make, I'll, I'll make um, some concrete proposals to which people can object and which I hope people will try out to see if they make any sense and that sort of thing uh, a bit later on. Um, I have a written bit. I could, I could read that. We could start off with that. Oh, wait, let's bow in first. Oh, yeah. All good. Onigashimasu. Onigashimasu. Hey, um, so in each session, um, that's going to give me a halo. In each session in uh, my online dojo, um, I begin by proposing some version of four basic agreements. Um, could everyone keep their mic muted until you're, um, you're chosen to speak or you choose to speak? And each time you decide to speak, can you please unmute and begin by saying your name? So I would unmute and say, hi, this is Brandon and whatever. Um, Thing to most sessions, um, including this one, as Quentin mentioned, are recorded to be shared publicly. And if at some point you need a recording to be removed from public view for any reason, you can notify us and we'll do our best. But once it's been released due to the nature of the internet, that we can't guarantee that anything can be removed. So please participate with that in mind. The third thing is I'd like to ask for an agreement that um, everyone will take care of themselves. Um, for instance, going off and returning in silence whenever you need to, but letting the host or the group know if there's some way in which we may support you. And the last thing and most important is um, everyone um, of every description and identity is most welcome in anything that I participate in um, because, because of rather than in spite of their differences. We will work through conflict by way of difference as though the skills involved are the building blocks of a martial art and can be learned in the company of others through repetition. And that's what I intend to do. Um, can we take a minute to hear from anyone who feels moved to say something at this time? Or, and if you continue after this, I'll assume that we have an agreement on all four of those points. So if you want to say something, uh, stick your hand up, but if you're okay, you, can, you don't need to do anything at all. I think you're good to go, Brandon. Lovely. So <clears throat> Aikido 2.0 is a celebration of Aikido, not a replacement or chucking out of anything. 
Um, I will only know if you have made, if I've made my case here, if you explore what I propose after our time together, find that it makes sense and is obviously helpful, and then change the way you practice Aikido in search of long-term benefits for yourself and your students. If you don't improve what you're doing in some way, then this is not time well spent. Uh, and that is not a foregone conclusion. Please don't take any claims at face value and doubt everything, especially your own reactions to what you hear. Investigate each idea to see if in practice it will hold the water of understanding. Please make objections in public and don't claim to have understood until you can demonstrate yourself that something works. Any questions so far? No, one comment. Even if Please. people don't find it useful, they've still learned something. Could be, but uh, time well spent, uh, that's up to you to decide, weight against your other options. Um, whether it was time well spent. And I encourage you to wonder that even aloud and say, I'm not sure this was, I have the following questions and doubts. So that's really super helpful to me. Um, so let's begin moving um, together with something familiar. And obviously you can do whatever you would like in response to this, but um, Quentin on the 26th um, offered a class in which he defined centering as creating a state where you are focused, relaxed and grounded and in so doing, take power away from outside concerns and negative thoughts, allowing you to fully appreciate the circumstances you are in and make appropriate decisions as to what action will serve you best in any situation. Centering. Uh, making the formal definition a slightly less formal, he asked, are you relaxed, focused, and happy with what you are doing? Sort of a... Um, reframing what he had said in a, in a more biteable chunk. So let's continue to follow his lead um, as I remember it. And uh, I'm Quentin can give me uh, feedback later if you would like, but uh, will you join me? Um, he asked, you could, he, would you like to sit? Would you like to stand? And the question he asked after that was, are you comfortable? So that's your, that's your metric for deciding whether this is a good idea or not. So centering must require being comfortable for this particular exercise. Um, I'm gonna stand up. <clears throat> and um, the next thing was breathing. Um, and then, please try not to just think about it, but to do it in whatever way that means for you. As you're breathing, I would add more than you think you need, more than you think you need in, more than it felt like you had out. Notice your bits relaxing. Notice the rhythm and the slowing down. And he brought the words in calmness, contentment, tranquility. He asked that we clear our minds, follow the breath, notice the ground under your feet and your knees, your hips, your shoulders, your hands, and how they're hanging to your side potentially, or if you're seated, they might be resting on your legs. The elbows might be hanging from the shoulder and your neck and your face. specifically your forehead, around the eyes. This is a Zoom thing that Brandon's doing. The, the jaw. Yeah. I'm hearing a voice that isn't mine. If you'd please mute. And after you go through and you breathe and you notice your bits relaxing, you might find that your mind opens and is ready to receive information and make the most out of the class. And I would ask that you check to see if any of the things that I have mentioned are so. Are you in touch with any of the, any of the bits of you while breathing you noticed? Did they relax? Are they changed? 
And is your mind more open to receiving information and making the most of the class? And if it is, how did that happen? And if it isn't, is there something that you could do that would make it more likely? Quentin then suggested that centering, not just this particular centering exercise, but centering in general, can be a touchstone in your daily life, his word. That it can happen anywhere, under any circumstances. And he more than implied that it would help you to have an open mind and a readiness to receive information and make the most out of whatever. So I'd like to ask that you ask yourself, is that so? Is it present in your life? Are you using it? Are you doing something like this? And when do you do that? What happens? What's it like? He then went on to ask us to look at the role of teacher and suggested that the teacher is someone who shines a light so that each person can guide themselves which is a bit of a counterpoint to how teacher is often um, imagined. Receptacle of wisdom, etc., And then asked, who is the student? Who is the teacher? Who is the student? How does that work? So I prefer to be right up front with my proposals. And while we're centering, I would like to ask that you consider these, um, hoping that we can wrangle with them out loud rather than sort of grumbling inwardly and killing opportunities for improvement by not trying them out. So proposal one, Aikido is wonderful. I have loved the practice for my entire life. Uh, it deserves to blossom again worldwide by always becoming more itself. And um, in my opinion, that involves carrying on the explicit directive of the founder to develop, but also move beyond dojo practice and defeating opponents to offering the world explicit and specific conflict training that is martial, psychological, systemic, and which habituates people to work through differences nonviolently by repeated experiences in person and across all forms of media. Second proposal, this is achievable by creating an Aikido 2.0, offering basic study to every age level, which integrates directive, excuse me, redirective communication with traditional Aikido curriculum to be practiced fully on the mat and off. And it is essential that we move beyond talking about Aiki principles and practicing them, by which we would test, did we do that thing um, and see what the outcome was and adjust accordingly in the same way that we would physically. Um, uh, and, and Paul Linden is with us, who is an excellent example of not only doubting everything and testing it to see what's actually going on, but um, what I call attaching a dial to it and say, if I more of this, less of this, what result do I get until you have a subtle understanding, or I should say a more subtle understanding of how things work um, in uh, what the world is coming to call soma. When someone says somatic, um, a lot of the time what they mean is embodied an, a whole systems view. Um, so rather than splitting into mind, brain, body, soul, spirit. Somatic suggests that um, all of these are different ways of looking at the same dynamic and multi-level system as it's alive and happening in the moment. So I'll, I'll pull out the word somatic frequently and I'd like for you to join me at least for this session in imagining that what that means is everything we associate with ourselves and our body. And then I'd like to extend that metaphor to suggest that since we extend the metaphor, the body politic body of work, body of fill in the blank are all somatic ways of working with information and experience and making meaning in the world. Um, so 
The third proposal is the ways I take this basic study and make it advanced enough to work in real time won't be part of this session directly uh, unless we have time and interest later, but they are the following. After Aikido 2.0, which is taking communication, uh, redirective communication that's explicitly psychological and putting it in techniques that we're practicing on the mat. So language and movement, a somatic understanding practiced on the mat. So basic silent Aikido, if you want to call it that, and then communication and movement, and then improvisational. What I do next is I, I do what I call martial nonviolence, which is taking that and taking it into a theatrical improvisational environment, and then teaching facilitation so you can engage with systems. So not only do we take Aikido techniques and teach them with communication, with explicitly psychological communication involved, but then we do theater improv and we also do facilitation and I teach those too. So that martial nonviolence is being able to do your work yourself, engage with a partner and participate in systems so that they shift in a nonviolent direction. Um, that whole, the whole system I call conflict done well. Um, and then when I take the martial nonviolence method and I apply it to a particular uh, group based on their needs, I call that peace practices. And that was the internationally funded um, project that went into Montessori schools and private schools and all that sort of thing in the Bay Area, and that I did racial equity work and, and um, all that sort of thing in downtown Oakland. So Aikido 2.0, martial nonviolence, conflict done well, and then if you apply martial nonviolence to a group, I call it peace practices. And I can talk more about that later, and um, I invite you to go to culturesmith.com and sign up for my email list and classes, and we'll explore that with me later. And if we have questions about that, we can certainly look into them. You want to um, just pause, Brandon, and see if people have any comments on your proposals, uh, comments, questions, that. Like disagreeing with it. Um, again, so you've got an opportunity to speak up, uh, hold your hand up if you so wish, and unmute if you're, you're going to say something. And exercises are coming up next. So we are, we're going to move this right away because we've are, we're already 20 minutes into the session, give or take. Okay. Well, it, I think, oh, Paul wants to say something. So I'm mute, Paul. In what sense are these different things proposals? Say again? What sense are, are these different things proposals? Are you saying uh, I'm proposing to think this way or what? Yes, and, I'm, and, 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 the, and direct actions follow. Okay, good. So Aikido should um, engage in all forms of media by, so that people seek Aikido demonstrated and they're invited to participate in, in dojos that specifically adopt redirective psychological communications as part of their physical technique. It's practiced in every dojo, every, every time anyone gathers and that we show that. So then, so instead of the Seagal movies, the next big thing they would see is um, movies in which Aikido is featured in which it's explicitly um, part of the story that they are using all of the things that we associate with Aikido, either through their Japanese names or lists like Quentin just distributed of principles. And you can see very clearly that they're being um, deployed as tactics and that the greater strategy is peace or everybody getting a shot at what they need, getting what they need and a shot at what they want, which is my definition for peace. And that was just proposal one. Anyone else or can we let Brandon crack on? I think we're good to crack on. Right. Um, so as an example, uh, if we were to practice um, Tai Sabaki, which um, different uh, body management, moving around, um, um, we have different words for it, um, but we all have the same number of limbs more or less. Um, and um, you, you can imagine your, the, everyone moves in and moves out and turns and that sort of thing. So um, let's move around a little bit. I'm going to engage my foot cam. Well, if you're seeing just feet, that's Brandon. Yes. And there will be the only feet that say Brandon Williams Craig next to them. Um, <laughs> and and what, I'm going to, what I'm going to propose is that we do classic Aikido Tai Sabaki and, we, and then we add a script so that we're speaking in addition to moving. And it may seem odd at first. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping that it will, um, but I'm hoping that you'll jump the boundary of, this is very strange. 
Uh, because in the same way that you were a beginner when you walked into the dojo and weren't sure what to do, it will open up a part of your brain that allows you to really consider the proposals rather than just thinking about them, to entertain them as it were. So um, everyone please get into, let's see, I'm gonna be in right on me so it may look like left to you. You can match me and let your hands be extended so that your fingertips are up and the blade goes forward and your elbows and shoulders drop and your arms are apart from your body in a way that doesn't mean make you reach. And your forward hand will be the same side as your forward foot. And just bring your weight forward without letting your head pop up by shifting your back foot up and switch which foot is forward. We're just changing which foot is forward. Bringing the foot forward by closing the hip and bringing the other foot back. So just change which foot is forward. Being in control of your balance so that you feel one vertical line of balance the whole time. And now as you're doing that, establish your root, ground yourself and say, I am here. I am here. I am here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And all movement communicates body language. All movement communicates. This is a different sense than this is, than this is. So communicate, arrival. You could choose not to be moved or to move. You are here. And see if your inner state can match the words and the way that your body looks, how you present and what message you communicate. And then let's step to the side instead of directly in front. Shoot the foot all the way to the side and pull yourself into that foot and then back into Hami as though you were getting out of the way and let someone come by and say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. All right, Irimi, I'm in and then withdraw, I'm out and switch sides, excuse me. I'm in, I'm out, excuse me, I'm in, I'm out, excuse me, I'm in, I'm out. And then pivot right where you are as though you were looking behind you, but close the front hip so the knee goes over the toe and open the back hip and say, who's there? Who's there? Excuse me. Who's there? Who's there? Excuse me. Okay. And then shoot in and turn. Kayla Fader Sensei calls this uh, an Irimi blend. So you're going to go in, I'm in, and you're going to turn. Who's there? And you're behind the person that you're facing, you're originally facing. So you're going to say, I'm behind you. I'm behind you. Excuse me. I'm behind you. I'm behind you, excuse me, okay. Now you're going to close the front hip so that the foot and the knee both point in the same direction. And as your weight shifts, you're going to swing the other foot behind you, tenkan. And again, close the front, sweep the back, tenkan. And this time say, I'm listening and do so. Look out and let your awareness go out. Listen in 360 degrees and pay attention, I'm listening. I'm listening, excuse me, I'm listening, I'm listening. And now open your front foot and take two steps as you rotate, one step, two, and you're facing in the opposite direction. Open two step, open, one, two. And as though someone were facing you and they were doing the same thing, you're going to say, what do you see? Because you end up seeing what they saw and you couldn't see before which was their perspective. What do you see? Excuse me. What do you see? What do you see? Okay. And let's do one more. Let's do a closed two step where you leave the front foot and instead of opening it before you step, you close both your hips, your knees almost touch and then you open both your hips and you turn 180 degrees, but you're doing it quickly and on a dime. So close two step, 
like someone said, behind you, and you said, where? So that gets the feeling of it, where? 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 Okay, any questions about these so far? So now I'd like to ask you to participate in an exercise in which I say them in, a, in an order that is not the way in which they were presented, and you do your best to keep up with what we're doing, moving your body and saying these new scripted things that you may never have heard before so that your brain goes, wait, I'm not ready for this. And then you let go of doing it the right way and just do your best to get involved each time you find your attention straying. So if your attention wanders to, wait, I didn't get that right, bring it back as fast as you can to just doing what we're doing and trying to find yourself in the flow of what we're doing. So Hami, breathing, centering. I am here. I am here. Who's there? Who's there? I'm in. I'm out. I'm behind you. I'm listening. What do you see? I'm in. Who's there? Excuse me. I'm in. Who's there? What do you see? Excuse me. I'm behind you. Who's there? Okay. Is anybody totally confused and in need of support of some kind? All right. So um, in large part, the purpose of exercises like this is to engage the parts of your brain that don't often work together. The immediate martial benefit is this helps to smooth over the gap psychologically, I should say somatically. It smooths over the gap between being in the social contract, which is to say we talk to each other, we make shared decisions with respectful dialogue, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of the time an attacker will come up to a potential victim and say something, anything. Have you got a dime? Um, you know, those are nice shoes. And then bam, so they engage the part of your brain that says, ah, we're talking. And then they whack you. And um, if, you're, if you're accustomed to working so that all conflict is all conflict, your body doesn't turn off when your language center goes on and your language center doesn't turn off when your body goes on. But you may have found, if, if you've ever been um, suddenly come on, even not necessarily, it could have been an accident or something, you find it's difficult to speak. Um, and there's clenching and there's holding of breath and things like that. And one of the ways to smooth that over is to speak and move in conflict over and over and over again so that your mind generates options no less um, quickly than your body does from years of Aikido practice. Uh, so that I, I would like to suggest that as we practice, it should be clear what the martial benefit of it is, and it should be clear what the psychological connection of that is, and not only that they are related, but which parts you would use in which circumstances. So I am not suggesting that you would use physical Aikido all the time if someone is not physically attacking you, that you would literally move your body around or grab them or whatever, but that as metaphor, as imagination, the structures that we suggest in Aikido, especially the theoretical structures, transfer very well across domains. And that is what Quentin is suggesting too, if I may put words in your mouth, by putting out a list of what in older days would have been referred to as the virtues, as ways of living a life that you're proud of, that work well for you, that fit well into society. Um, and how do you do that? And, and the proposals that people have offered through the ages are, you pay attention to the following thing and they list the following things that you should pay attention to. And if those things, you can check them off, then you're probably doing what you can do to be moral, upright, um, honestly engage in relationship, things like that. So if we look at our practice somatically, the movement that we do communicates something. 
And that's where martial nonviolence originally came from, is that my first career was in the professional theater. I grew up at the Dallas Theater Center and went on national theater tours and things like that. And what I noticed for my Aikido students is that they were not communicating clearly through their bodies with their partner. The technique required for them to blend with their partner and they were yanking on their partner, like, come on, come on, come on. And come on, come on, come on is a different exercise than, hey, shall we head this direction? Which is what the more subtle connected to center movement feels like when you're on the mat. And so I would say, well, why don't you pretend that you are fill in the blank? And I would give them scripts and I would suggest to them that they were in, in fact actors and I was a director for the moment. And what I'm wanting the audience to see is I'm wanting them to understand this movement. I'm wanting to understand what you're communicating and your character doesn't yank people around. They, gen they wait, they accompany, they touch gently instead of grabbing. And even though your character is under a lot of stress, that is not how your character reacts. So fake it and then make it more and more believable and tell anyone watching you, including your own internal viewer and your partner, it's totally believable. And the question becomes, what pairs well? What are you communicating with your particular tactical choice? And does it serve a particular strategy or are you just randomly trying not to get whacked all the time? Is ukemi because I'm going over there to then turn around and do a thing? Or is ukemi, oh, thank God I survived that. At least I'm standing up again, which is a, which is a, different, a different way of doing it, of, of being in the ukemi. Questions so far? Comments? Yes, I've got one. Um, so um, you said that pairing the words with the body uh, was, was, was a good thing to practice. What was your evidence for that? Where, where did you come up with this? What, 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 you know, where did you start? Yeah. Um, well, I, I started teaching um, communication in Aikido um, somewhere in the vicinity of 99, um, 2000. And um, it was entirely about speaking directly to mechanical problems with Aikido techniques. So, and the, the reason I continued it is there was a difficulty. My Munetsuki Kodigaishi doesn't work, followed by my saying, oh, well, how about if you say the words with your body and with your mouth um, they're going to punch and they'll say me first and they're going to try to hit you because you've done something that's you know out of sequence they don't agree with who's what order whose turn it was and your response is going to be um come here and you're going to yank on them and then go back and with your body and with your mouth instead say um let's go together and they'd go, let's go together. I mean, oh, I, I heard it from your mouth, but I didn't see let's go together from your body. I didn't, it wasn't believable. So go back and do it again. And so I did the same thing I do with my acting, my singing and dancing students. My, I, I did exactly the same thing as saying, I'm sorry, that's not, that didn't, that didn't work. Go back and do it again. And it's the same thing. I, if I were okay and they yanked on my hand, I would, um, I would stop because I'm not, I'm not being moved by you. You're not moving me. And it's not that I'm trying to be mean, it's that I would like for them to know that they didn't, they weren't in fact moving me. And when they do, by gosh, I'm all for the moving. And it's exactly the same thing and as just easy, is just as easily measured. If I were to say to you, you know, Quentin, that, that, uh, that sweater and that uh, shirt, they just don't go together. And, and you were to say, oh, well, I'll go change them. And you immediately went and changed it. I'd be like, yeah it worked and if you looked at me and said keep your fashion advice to yourself I would think Ooh, wow that didn't work because the objective is to get you to change your clothes and it I didn't so you see what I'm saying it's not uh, uh, the, nicely illustrated so my second question is uh, and you said well you, you know you can't you can't be doing movement all over the place when I mean you're having a bit of an argument with your boss or something you know swirling around the room and moving from excuse me to you know I'm in and I'm out that's not really going to work for you but when you're having those conversations, are you kind of mentally thinking, I'm in now, and oh, excuse me, and that sort of thing? Is that what you're doing? So you, you, because you've rehearsed them together, you've got that sort of mental picture that goes with it. With the yes. Yeah. The, well, some, and this, this is from someone else. They asked me if I had seen the Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr. 
in which there is a, a slowing down of the action. And the, the fantasy of that movie is that you can, he's plotting in advance what will happen and arriving at where he wants to be with his blow because that, and he's accurately predicting the future. And that's, um, I can only imagine that being literally true in the most ideal of circumstances. Um, but I vector, th I, I do what I call, what I tell my students is, is imagine the energy, I do mean imagine, as energy, that means a lot of things to a lot of people, but just imagine it as a physics problem. And this goes in a predictable direction. And it's gonna probably continue in that direction. Just it, it, the likelihood is high. If I say, I absolutely will not do what you're telling me, that is communicating a particular directional energy. And unless I successfully redirect it, you will continue not doing what, I, what I'm asking for. So I would need to, and I see that, I imagine it in whatever way works for me. And it turns out that you can see in the metaphors of all, of all the times we communicate, especially in conflict, the metaphors are packed with somatic images. They're directional, they're physical, they're, you drop, you drop a task, you keep the balls in the air, you, back, let me, I gotta back away from that. Can I get in on this? There's all kinds of, all of our metaphors are embodied metaphors. And so it's not a jump as soon as you open your eyes to that to anticipate what's coming next. When you get a really strong vector of some kind, it's likely to continue in that direction. And the same thing is true of talking about something. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Brandon, I found sure. Two, two, two difficulties. One is I didn't know any of your vocabulary. I didn't know what you meant by open the hips, close the knees. I couldn't see them. The other thing was I didn't know what, you didn't say that you're adopting an attitude in, in the sense of an emotional attitude. So I could say, excuse me, and be meaning, get out of my way and say it sweetly. The, I, I didn't, you, you didn't, when you explained it, then it made sense. But if, the, if I'd had the explanation first, and I would have known what we were practicing. Are you ready for a response? Of course. I have a foot cam that was showing my legs and my hips. I don't have enough room in this particular place to have all of me in one camera, but I'm working on that. Um, as far as the internal state is concerned, um, what I'm hoping to do in these exercises is to not explain it all the way first and then to set up the circumstance so that someone will come to the same conclusion you did and then realize that they are this far from connecting what they say, which they have imagined is separate from what they're, what they're feeling and what they're doing to all of that. So that they are then no longer able to escape responsibility for what they're communicating with their whole person. Because yeah, right now, I have, the social, I have the social permission to say, hey, come on, and mean, I'm gonna kill you. Right. I, can, I can say things that are entirely incongruous with my actual intentions, and I'm encouraged to do so. Oh, I feel fine. But when I obviously don't feel fine. Thematically, you'll show that. But what I'm, the, the, for me, with the Parkinson's, I can't control certain things that I used to be able to. The other thing you were assuming was stand up, move this foot here, put this, this foot there, and you're not giving a chance for a translation to a different movement set for those who need it. But more to the point, when I first started, at one point I said, Oh, Bob didn't say that the mind was connected to the body. I didn't know that they were supposed to transfer when he did those exercises. The person looked at me and said, how could you not know that? I said, I could not know that. Yes, I find that, um, and this, this may be just me um, projecting my dilemmas on, on my students, but I find that the more I explain frequently, the less they understand and not the other. Especially since I'm the talking guy who's supposed to be putting all of the words into the techniques. I find that I explain and go deeply into examples so much that I, I provide insufficient somatic experience of what's being proposed. And if someone else discovers what you just said, it changes the way they understand it rather than my explaining it to them. But I flip a coin based on what I think the individual person or group needs and either go in the direction of outlining absolutely everything in the way that I know Paul Linden likes which it really works well for a lot of people and just saying energy and letting them go and do a thing and then go energy, what the heck does that mean? And then they have a better base for getting what the metaphor means than if I had told them what I mean by it. My take on it is you're a genius in a certain area <laughs> and that area that you're teaching to 
And for, that's the opposite of what my area was. So I don't need detail. I just need to be told, this is what I mean to accomplish. By these movements, I mean to, what you said at the end, by these movements, I'm joining the words to the body and the movement. I didn't know that was what you're doing. Thank you. It may seem stupid, and it is, but then that's not, that's, you're the area, you're, you, geniuses can't teach areas that, that, for people that are not geniuses. Suffice to say, there are many different approaches and the whole point of these sessions is in to introduce people to lots of different ways of thinking about it and see what works for them and pull in what they want. So we have got a few geniuses on this uh, board at the moment. Let this particular one carry on, Brandon. Well, and let me also say, just to be transparent about it, that I've studied with Paul. I traveled to his dojo and, and, was, and you know, stayed there for a while. Uh, what, what Paul has done and is doing is a, is a significant part of my understanding of this. So, and Paul was a part of IKEA Extensions. And when I got brought in to be executive director, Paul was one of the people I got sent to, to in that kind of, you need to know about the parameters of what the organization is trying to do and what our identity is. Paul is one of the pillars of, the, of that. So he's, he's carrying on a conversation that he and I have had for a very long time and which has always, and I can say that in, with a straight face, has always been helpful. So thank you, Paul. Me too. I saw something that I didn't see about your practice. So thank you. So another exercise, um, we, I, I, I usually start with the, the three big basics that um, almost everybody in Aikido has practiced under one name or another. So let's do Taino Henko, um, or some people call it um, Katate Dori Tenkan. Um, it's the one hand is extended, you, and, and we're imagining, obviously, because we're remote to each other. One hand is extended, the other person, the imagined person or the person across grabs. And um, a, a basket shape happens in the, in the particular version that I'm talking about. So there's a grab on the arm, a basket shape is made so that the energy runs this way. And then as the foot does that, I don't know if you can see my foot cam. I can't actually see my foot cam at the moment, but as the hand does that, without retreating, there's a rotation point or in Japanese jiku right there that you engage so that you can rotate around it rather than trying to move the hand. So there's an extension, there's a grab, you extend into the partner and you move your balance around in a way that goes around this point, um, engaging with their center so that they are moved off their center forward. And then you continue your turn with, with the Tenkan until you're facing the opposite direction and you would be side by side with your with your partner, your ear not very far from their head, and they would be they would be slightly bent in order to hang on, so you can still feel their weight and check and see if you're moving them or not. So let's, in whatever way you understand Taino Hanko, the very first thing we're going to just just do it, just be the um, nage or whatever you whatever you would call that, the person initiating the technique, and just practice that a few moments by yourself. Okay, yeah. And now through the camera, um, you can cycle through the people. You can see if you can't see everybody. Choose, um, let's see. Let's just do it at random. Let's see what happens. Half of the people in an ideal situation would choose to be uke and half of the people would choose to be nage. And so you're going to watch and some, some people are going to do this and come forward toward the camera and grab. And other people are going to do this. And if you'll do four in whatever way you choose and then choose to do something else, somebody will be choosing you to be your partner. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. I can put people into 14 breakout rooms. So they're all <laughs> paired up and then we can come back in a couple of minutes. How would that be? All right, then let me let me give even more let me give even more instructions. Then, please do it with your partner. Well, actually, Ash, will you demonstrate with me, right quick? Sure. Okay, so um, Ash is going to grab and be okay, and I am going to offer before that 
he'll know when to grab because I put my hand out, he'll reach forward and grab, and I'll be nage, he'll be uke. And we'll do it silently four times. So I'll put my hand out, he'll come towards me and start, and start to grab me. And as soon as he does that, I will turn. And obviously I'm working on timing more than I'm working on, but he can't grab me literally. So I offer, he sees that, he comes for it. I turn and I respond to him and then I go back. And I'm gonna do that four times in silence. And then, um, I'm, and then we're gonna switch and he's gonna do it four times in silence. And then after he's done it four times in silence, we're going to add language. And the job is that the person who is grabbing will say, um, it's your fault. No, let's see, let's do, uh, you are wrong. You are wrong. So Ash is gonna say you're wrong and I'm going to respond with I'm listening. You're wrong. I'm listening. You're wrong. I'm listening. Um, and I'm going to give Ash the feedback that it's very difficult to actually see his body with the golden gate behind him. And he might help because he flashes in and out like a Marvel character. And so I'm trying, I can't really see when he's going. So the voice actually helped me to know when to go. But you can give your partner feedback, do four each silently, and then do four each triggering on each other saying you are wrong and I'm listening. So in total, everyone will get a chance to do everything four times silently and four times um, allowed. And you can just keep repeating that until Quentin brings us back. Okay. So I, when, whoever I'm paired with, we'll go through it. And when we're done, we'll give them a 10 more seconds and I'll pull everybody back. Uh, that sounds when you get the signal, just come straight back if you would, please. And, and Paul, Paul, you're connecting your language, your body movement, and your mind or your psychological state. Okay. Thank you. So what about the breakout rooms? Uh, how do I get round this one? Steve's blind, Brandon. Say again. <laughs> Brandon's blind, uh, Steve's blind, and Vitaly's in a wheelchair, as is Molly. Uh, it might not be a problem for them, uh, it, you know, so. Yeah, it's, it's, an sure. it's an exercise in imagination, and it's also an exercise in the things that you can put your yeah. hand so to speak, which is timing. It could be entirely auditory if your eyes are the issue. It can be entirely um, imagined um, if, you're, if, if the movement is, uh, is difficult to do. It's also possible, as Molly will tell you, yay, Molly, that you can move your body um, in a way that's not exactly what you're seeing, but in a way that informs your ability to respond under these circumstances. And you, like anything else, you would adjust what the exercise is, break any rule you need to, to make it useful for you so that what you get is an experience of making the connections that we're making. And then you can come and teach us what the, okay. the, the, group, the group is the is the source of wisdom in this case. There you go, guys, I'm gonna set off the rooms. I'm still stuck in the main room. I don't know why I am. I thought I was going to disappear <laughs> somewhere. Well, Brandon, I'll practice with you. How would that be? Brandon, can you hear me? Brandon? Steve, can you hear me? Steve, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to practice? As I, uh, I'm, I'm lacking a practice partner at the moment. Um, I don't know how I got moved. Yes, I won't be on camera at all. Well, well you, you can either not be on I? camera, um, or you can sit there and imagine you're moving, and I'll do the movement. How would that be? Yeah, that, that'll that'll work, but it. Oh gosh. Um, may I make a suggestion? Yeah, 
Steve, if you'll be in control of starting things and stopping things and tell us when you're ready, and the movements that you're making are should be geared to whatever is helpful and useful for you. So you guide us and set us up in whatever way will be helpful to you. Um. Are we going to work as like a threesome? Here? We certainly could. Okay. Um, or we could just take turns going around and everyone could take a turn kicking things off, so to speak. All right, well, why don't you, you lead the way. I'll go with you to start with. Mm. It's, I got included in this group by way of my foot cam, so I'm trying to rearrange things. All right, so Steve, if you would put your hand up as though you were creating space between yourself and somebody else, as though you were telling them, this is the, this is the limit of where you may come, this is my personal space. Oh. Extend a hand. And then when, um, when Quentin says, um, you're wrong, your job is to turn the, the wrist out and the, the fingertips will point back toward you as though you were pointing to the side for someone to head off in that direction. And you'll respond with, I'm listening. How does that sound? It, it, it's not easy to uh, deal with it um, mentally. I understand approximately, but I, it's just not. It's not working for me at all at the okay. moment. If it, if it were only an auditory exercise and your only job was to respond to the words you are wrong with the words I'm listening, would that be satisfactory for the moment? No, I think I'd have to really work it from scratch anyway, from a different uh, way of, of dealing with it. Uh, this online, I've not found a solution yet to put to solve okay. that. Brandon, no, it looked, huh. I'm just going to suggest that we abandon the experiment with us and we pull people back from the room because I think you can see people coming back to me. We've obviously had a chance to try it. Um, is that okay? So you're going to put us back in the rooms again? I, I'm going to bring people back from the rooms to the main session. Shall we try one thing before you do that? Of course, yeah. Right. So, um, I'd like to say you were wrong, and I'm going to come toward my camera. We well, are I'm wrong. <laughs> that whoever's ready, that whoever's ready um, turn in whatever way they can, even in their chair as they are sitting, um, moving their body back and forth. As long as you're moving from your core, that's and you're going to move the hand that you've extended into the air. You're going to move it as though you were indicating it's time to go toward the side that your come belly is facing. So here I come. You're wrong. I'm listening. Very good. Come on. And one more time on the other side. You're wrong. Yeah. And would someone else take a turn saying you're wrong? And I'll take a turn with everyone else saying I'm listening. Okay. So I'm, I'll say I, I'm, you're wrong. Yeah. I'll come Please. Before. You're wrong. I'm listening. You're wrong. I'm listening. All right. We've got a couple of repetitions anyway. Hope they come back sooner than the 51 seconds we have. The direction about my clothing clearly worked, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, Fergie. Hey. Come on in, hop up. Good boy. And Steve, we can we can still hear you if it's possible for you to mute. Yeah, it's a dog. <laughs> 
I just yeah. take, put them out. Well, I will be back with you. All right. So, um, one of the things we found um, in working with uh, children um, at a Montessori school in the East Bay in, in Emeryville was that um, they found this silly and then boring and then they started doing it all over the place and then they was, it was heard um, as sort of the new thing to experiment with on the playground and it went through cycles of being the new thing that everybody did, finding it silly and playing with it and then finding it boring and then starting it again and it became a part of their group culture to use the script and to hear when someone had said something similar to it and go, oh, oh, peace practices. So it became a part of their shared narrative and experience to the point that um, uh, in many cases on the playground, all the teachers had to do was say, wait, what happens in peace practices? And the kids went out with it just like that because it was simple and it had gone through all of the phases of them identifying with it, disidentifying with it, making fun of it, playing with it. And it just became a part of their um, Argo. They just kept on bringing it out all the time. Um, so it was a handle to be grasped by anyone who wanted to, to say, hey, let's do this by the rules we've more or less agreed on by participating in that class over and over and over again. And they learned physical Aikido on the mat with language inside the techniques and the language immediately translated because we'd done it over and over into their interactions on the playground and in the classroom. Are you in touch with any of those children still? I am not. Some of their parents um, still get back to me. Um, the children um, start were, were from three to nine years of age, most of them that were in our classes. Um, and so um, it's, uh, it's arguable whether it's appropriate for you know, years after to still be in contact with them directly because that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Okay. But, but are, the, some, are, some of the children that were in my children's program um, at Aikido of Berkeley and afterwards, I, I do still get interaction from some of them. One of them was the one who asked me to, to provide a training for the Occupy Oakland people um, when they were on um, the plaza there in downtown Oakland. Um, so I keep people keep people keep coming back because I've been doing it a long time. So, sure. so uh, another way of putting that. Okay, I know you're a parent. Uh, I always feel that I brought Aikido into my parenting style. Uh, do you sometimes see your children doing things and you think, oh blimey, it has rubbed off. That's good news. Yeah. And, and to be fair to any other parent out there, family is the, the most difficult place to apply anything that you know, because the power dynamics are the most important thing at, that, at those developmental periods. It's, you know, you can't make me do anything. Okay, I'll do what you tell me. As the, ch as the child is internalizing the parental, you know, voice, so they have their own executive function, they, they do all kinds of pushback and do things that are bizarre that other people wouldn't do. But yeah, it comes, it comes out of my kids all the time, especially the next part. Okay. I'm wondering if people want to give us uh, feedback or say something about what just happened in session. I, I, I would. Have... I would oh. like to. This is Patrick speaking. There's two of us. I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, two things. So I got my own room. Nobody showed up. So I did it by myself. It worked fine. So what I noticed on when I verbalized uh, you're wrong, I noticed two things. My chest tightened quite a bit and it was very difficult to do the movement, to do the grab, to move forward and grab. The second thing I noticed is when I said, I'm listening, the opposite happened. I opened up, my chest relaxed, my body you know, it opened up, I relaxed and it was quite easy to move in. So those are my observations. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, those reactions are reasonable given the feeling that he put into them. If he said, I'm listening with the thought that when I hear you, when I hear you, I know where you are and I'll kill you. The words and the movement would have been very different. Yes. That, well, that's one of the main reasons for introducing acting as such into the, into the process, not to suggest that people would become professional actors, but if you want to become a conflict professional, you have to be aware of how you come across you have to be aware of the way you're presenting, what your costume suggests, um, what your face looks like and how people would interpret it. It's one of the reasons that acting as such is one of the most essential skills in actually taking anything you learn somewhere else and into a professional, you know, real time situation um, is that even a violinist has to act in the appropriate way to be received as a, as a professional violinist. And that, that goes, that's across the board. It's just usually not made explicit. 
Yeah. So what you're saying is there has to be congruence between kind of the, the, the emotion, the, the, the words and the bodily action. Is, you, you communicate things differently and it can, it can serve a particular end to say one thing and mean another and have that come across. I can tell you I feel fine knowing full well that I sound like I don't feel fine. And I hope that you pick that up because I can't actually tell you out loud how I feel, but I can communicate it with my body in a way that allows you to understand me without having, so I don't have to say the thing I can't get to come out my mouth. And that happens in, in conflict all the time. And it happens in physical conflict even more frequently is that people's tells become immediately available. I don't really want to be doing this macho thing. Please, please offer to buy me a beer so I don't have to get beat down. And you can say, you want a beer? And they're like, oh, thank God. Yes, sure. Let's have a beer. And you can, they can let go of whatever it is because we tell constantly, we tell people what we really mean by what we do. But it's even more powerful if we actually say it as well. Absolutely, because you communicate on every possible level. Okay. Take us to the next level. Um, did I see, uh, with Finn, were you raising a hand? I, th I thought I noticed a hand there. Yes, um, I, I was I found it really interesting. I, I was also practicing by myself and find myself sort of blending with myself. So the, the, the phrases became joined as you would join in that activity. But I just wondered, in conversation and when you, when we're speaking, uh, we can't speak at the same time and and without conflict. So how do you avoid conflict in speech? I was thinking I'm coming to this from a musical point of view where you can harmonize and people can music together, but we can't speak together without raising a, a conflict. Yeah, well, I, I, in when that question comes up, the exercises I use when we're doing martial nonviolence is uh, I pretend it's an acting exercise for improv which is what I do all the time. And there are a thousand different ways in which you can interact with someone. You can interrupt them. You can wait until there's complete silence before speaking. You can, I had a friend who had a mannerism of humming before when he really wanted to say something, he would go mm, until he had the chance to come in. And that's how he let everybody know I'm coming in. And there's all kinds of ways that you can do that. The question is just which tactic, which of those things imagined as a tactic advanced is the strategy you're trying to pursue does it if the, if the if the desire is to connect with somebody you choose a different thing as paul linden would say than if you're desiring to dominate them you know as a, that's a specific kind of power over connection so the thing that you do reveals what you want and if what you do and what you want don't match it would be an interesting um, exercise to examine that and, and or have someone else, the audience, the third party, uh, say, you know, the message that I get is a very different one than what's coming out your mouth. And then you might want to give yourself permission to experiment with other ways of doing it, of interrupting people, of waiting until there's complete silence, of trying to come in right on the moment that they end in the same way that we, we experiment with timing on the Aikido mat. Am I early? Do I go right at the moment? Or am I, am I dragging a little bit? Do I come in after was the obvious moment to do that? And if, it's, if, we, if everything is training, because we're working on all of conflict, not just fisticuffs, but if, we're, if everything where there's difference is an opportunity to train how you do conflict, then everything we're talking about is one exercise or another. And the question is just how we do it. And there's a little sensei voice that hangs out right here and says, how'd that go? Did that, did that work out well for you? And it could be as extreme as, I noticed that you're lying on the ground with blood coming from your nose. How do you feel about that tactic? At which point they could say, well, hop right up and give it another shot. And this time you'll want to move a little more quickly to the side, which of course you would agree because, and the same thing is true psychologically is that when you do the thing and you realize, wow, that didn't express well, that didn't work. Didn't work over here, didn't work over there. Then you would try it differently next time and the job is not to triumph, it's to get better at the process. Uh, Liz and Alec have a hand up. So still want to yeah, say that's, that's me. Um, I've been a bit of, I've, being a bit of a naughty schoolboy, I was playing a bit with um, the exercise you, were exercising you were setting, Brandon. Um, and I was changing my intonation and delivery of my lines and seeing how it affected my movement. And I think you have already answered 
the kind of, kind of question that was coming out of that or the observation that was coming out of it, which is how you deliver your lines seems to affect how you move. Or at least it did for me. Um, yeah. I'd just like to see if that's, if I've sort of connected with something there or if I'm just way off on my own little universe. Um, the formula, how I do A affects B is I would argue the root of all of the study that we're doing, whether you do silent traditional Aikido practice or you're trying to figure out psychologically what works well and how you're communicating and how you come across. I, I wore this costume and as a result, I got treated like mm, I am speaking way too much. As a result, people are speaking too little. I'm, you know, you just fill, you fill in the blank with those things and think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if I did it this way what that outcome would be. And then you hone it and hone it and hone it, preferably with the company of someone who's a little better at it than you are, uh, who, or who will at least give you honest feedback so you can know how you come across, which like Paul was saying, is a very difficult thing sometimes. I don't know what's going on over here. I don't know what's going on over there. And trying to connect the two is a third mystery. And so you just start wherever you are and you start describing everything. Describe, well, it felt like this, felt like this. And that's what martial nonviolence does in general is it starts with description and it moves to proposal. I describe it this way. I would like to propose this. And that's the most basic uh, formulation that gets us into all of these mysteries that we're trying to figure out. Thank you. And, and thanks for the question. Um, so I am a little mindful of the time, Brandon. So it's yep. we have to finish, but somewhere between now and half past, we want to. So if you want to leave some space for people to ask questions or, or you, you know, just so you know. I do. Yeah. Um, would everyone like, well, uh, I mentioned um, an, uh, the exercise with Munetsuki Kotegaishi and the person who does the punching um, says me first, because um, uh, I, I've, I've been a mediator for many, many years. And a lot of the arguments in mediations can be reduced to the same kind of archetypal formulas. Um, and a lot of the time it has to do with just needing to tell the person that they're wrong. And once that's happened, we're done. Another, another, another one of the basics is it's your fault, which is suggesting that uh, you bear responsibility for, you're not just wrong, but you bear responsibility for doing a thing, carrying it forward, whatever. There's fault involved. And the third classic um, structure is that the order was off. It was my turn, not your turn. It's their turn, not their turn. And as long as you have the, pot, the chance of saying that the other person is wrong, whose fault it is, who, where the responsibility lies, and what sequence things can happen. Those are the, those three, uh, and there are several more, but those, those three are basic to most arguments and they come up at some point. So the, the, those, the three basic exercises are uh, Taino Hanko and doing you're wrong, I'm listening. Um, Muneski Kotegaeshi, me first, followed by let's go together as the hand gets taken away off, off the center and the, and the bodies go together in, in a circle. And then Shomenuchi Iriminage, which is a classic, you know, I hit you in the head or in the face sort of thing. Um, and that person says, it's your fault. And the other person responds, tell me more, as their body continues to go sort of in the trajectory it was originally intending before the loop over and the fall. So even if it's just a micro continuation, there's almost always a continuation of the movement in order to, to perform the drop. Have you uh, written down, have you scripted what you would like people to say to the various moves that you just throw? So actually, is that down on a bit of paper that you might oh, share with the group so that if they want to carry this on in their own practice, they've got something yeah. to do? It's on paper, it's on the website, it's on video. It's these three basic ones are the ones that I share with everybody when I make the, the pitch for Aikido 2.0. Right, cool, okay. Yeah. And you can search for peace practices on YouTube and conflict done well. And my last name, Williams Craig with, I, I just did a, a seminar for the, um, a group in Brazil. that was an international online seminar and all this stuff is in there too. And there's a, there's a, a really accessible walking around the room exercise um, that in, in which you check in with your various bits. Um, that is great. And in, in my opinion, it works really well in helping people to understand Tai Sabaki and, and how to make that work. Um, this will be a, yeah, someone just commented, this will be a YouTube video. Um, so there's all kinds of op options along those lines. And last plug, um, you can always sign into my class and say, can we work on that tonight? And I would be, I'd be happy to, to go back and review that with anybody. And we could, so we could do another standing up exercise. We could either do Shomenuchi Riminage or Munetsuki Kodagaishi. Uh, I could take some more questions. 
Um, but I do want a few minutes at the end so we can have just some open space at some point. So there'll be some silence in which something can come up. And then we have time, we actually have time to bow out and have a moment after that to not just sign off bye and gone so that we have a, a slightly more dojo feel about the experience. Um, so may, what, what, what do people want to do? So hands up if you would like to do some more movement or whether you would like to sort of one, two, okay, three. Uh, I, I'm gonna say the votes again against that. Uh, it seems to be that we, we move to conclusions, questions, queries. Okay. Uh, seems to be appropriate. Um, okay, so the, the floor is yours guys and girls. Uh, yeah, everyone that has to go and they're going before. Thank you so much for coming, Patrick, and anyone who has to go at this time. Thank you so much for being here. and. Um, I look forward to connecting with you again another time. So what are the traditional, what, so when you discuss this with uh, the Aikido community, how is it met generally? Um, I already do that. I know you do. How does it go? Well, that's the response. That's the response. Oh, we already do that. <clears throat> and I say, I say, oh, excellent. Please tell me how. And in general, they describe talking about the concepts um, as sort of a preliminary to class or as sort of a little um, um, Dharma talk. They, give a, they, they talk about the ideas either at the bar, before class or after class. And, and I, I have to repeat, oh, no, no. I mean, do you include psychologically savvy communication in the technique so there's not a break between we're talking and I'm punching you in the face? Do you, and the answer is always no. Um, and, you know, um, so that's the answer to your question is that they say, they either say we're already doing that or they say, don't be, don't be ridiculous. That's not Aikido. Um, and I say, oh, okay. And, and I say, so do you mind if we try that out? Do you mind? And, and in general, people are not well prepared, no matter what they think they're prepared to do in the same way they weren't prepared to deal with physical conflict before they spent some time on the mat. They are not prepared to do uh, tactically advisable things to when, in conversation while being attacked in conversation in order to get to a nonviolent outcome, one that's not power over somebody else. Okay. I, I find said, it very interesting because you've got the emotional level, the verbal level, the physical <coughs> level, and they can be mixed and matched. Yep. And you can do one at a time, two at a time, or three at a time. That's a very, that's a brilliant way of presenting it. Thank you. You can also add weapons. You can also um, do all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's not the one I had in mind, but sure. And it's, it's just like anything else. It's like, if you can do Rondori while I'm throwing foam balls at you, it's a much more interesting Rondori. And you'll know that you're more functional if you can do it with one person who will do nothing but grab your shoulders. Here, have more people. Here, have them be talking. Here, have people who are non-combatants that you're not allowed to throw down. You know, there's all kinds of things. And a basic Aikido is taught around the world in a way that is absolutely lovely. But let's go ahead and acknowledge that it's basic. Yeah, I, 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 th I totally support the idea that uh, people don't teach Aikido really with the, the bigger project in mind generally. I, how can we use this in everyday life? And that's a cultural choice. Yeah, it's a culture. And as, and as soon as the culture shifts and we say, so I, I've actually had people come back. I have, I've had two different people come to back to me and say, what have you been telling my students? And I said, I'm sorry, who are your students? Have we met? And, they, and their response is, they're asking me, why aren't we doing that stuff that he's doing? And, I'm saying, and I say, if you're expecting an apology for me, I apologize, you will not be getting one. Why aren't you doing that stuff? Why aren't you doing it? And then what do you mean why aren't I saying? Because you have all of these principles, Imasubi and you know, Takemusu and all of these, all of these massive metaphorical poetic, and you're not touching them. You're not talking about them, you're not doing what the founder did. And you know, I mean it helps if I outrank them, but it but a lot some of the times I don't. And you know, I just I I I want to know why are you not doing that? The oh. founder did. Why aren't you? Well, and then, well, yeah. that's a popular conversation. I think the interesting thing is that 
of course, the way I sense he did it was he certainly uh, talked about it within his culture and his political, his beliefs, not his political beliefs, it's just his beliefs. Yeah. Um, but but obviously he didn't do it the way you're doing it, which probably is much more meaningful for, you, for an American culture. And David, yeah. has hands up. Yeah, hi, Brandon, I'm David. Um, I was actually, well, I was just following, <laughs> Cretton's almost said it now, but I was just, you, you're saying, oh, Sensei um, did this stuff. I just wondered how you, um, uh, how that was manifest, as it were, in terms of these things you're talking about. Right, he used poetry and metaphor and language to, um, in, in almost every class, and to the great frustration of his students, he would at times make them sit and listen to him go on, on and on about various kami from history and the floating bridge of heaven and stuff like that. And he, and he would come out with uh, doka that are purposefully um, obscure and appropriate to his culture so that it was absolutely essential to think about that at the same time that you're moving. And then he would offer poetry as examples or explanations or not explanations of what the person was supposed to be thinking and feeling while they were moving. So uh, he, he didn't, um, I would argue being Japanese, he didn't explicitly have them speak when they were moving because that is the opposite of learning basic Aikido. Um, but he expected a certain um, environment in which metaphor and spiritual understanding and that sort of thing were all part of the process of training. Thank you. That's very clear. Thank you. Anybody else got anything? Dimitra. Yes. Uh, I want to say that I think it's extremely helpful to, to add the verbal attack, the verbal part in, in the grabbing or in the attack because it really challenges our uh, centering and our technique. And I remember once many years ago when my Tai Chi instructor, who is not following the, the main route, you know, he's very different from, from the main um, current, we would say, he would uh, do something similar, like encompass a really verbal attack, sometimes an insult, on purpose together with a grabbing or with a punching. And to our surprise, we noticed that the first thing beyond the technique is, are you able to keep your center if somebody enters your space and insults you intentionally? The first thing you notice is you lose your center. Not even thinking about practicing a technique. The first thing you practice is keep your center and then you can think about what kind of technique you're going to do. So it, it's very important that we embody these things. We understand with the body how difficult it is to, to practice Aikido in daily life or when there is a real attack because dojo is a very protected environment when you know that nobody's really attacking you and it's so much easier to keep your center and to do the technique properly when you are in a safe space like this. So I find this very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, had a, um, I had a drill instructor, a Marine Corps drill instructor and karate sensei tell me, we've been doing this forever. We, we, we really attack and, and you know, the Aikido, this is part of an Aikido is not a real martial art conversation that is endlessly going on. And I said, I said but, but you do. And it's, it's lovely, there's a, there's a great benefit to actually being hit by people who will stop. Really important that you feel what it's like to be hit in the face and in the body by someone who will stop when you say stop. Super important that the first time not be when it's a stranger. But the problem with drill instruction in the Marine Corps, and one of the problems, one of the dilemmas, and the problem with abusive, I would argue, um, martial arts teachers is that the thing that happened, the whole thing that happens ends up being abusive um, instead of helpful and sharpening the sword, it ends up dulling the sword when the whole experience is one in which it happens in fear and you don't know that you're protected and safe when it happens and you can't actually tell the person to stop and know that they will. So the pro we, we habituate, we do the things later that we've done over and over now. So for 
you know, the abusive um, in, uh, martial arts instructor or the, the, drill, the drill sergeant, they break down a part of the person that allows them to keep their center so that those people can control me and those people can't. And the difference between that sort of soldiery approach and a warrior approach is that nobody has permission to have complete control over me. It's my responsibility to make good decisions under pressure when the stakes are very high. And, and I can only learn that by being given a protected environment that I am then able to leave to go and get direct experience. And that transition between the two is something you have to work. And that's what this does. Right. Have you tried uh, letting people come up with their own scripts? Absolutely. In the same way that people come up with their own techniques, and that's where we're headed with the metaphor of takemusu, is that you, app, you give somebody, uh, and this is a response to Paul as well, you give something, somebody an absolutely clear script. Always say this every time, don't vary from it. So they can hate it, get bored, think it's funny, and it, and it drops down in them in a different way. And then they move it around and they say things that are sort of in the vicinity of that. The vector is the same, but the spin on it is different. And then the, in the three levels of, 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 of the three-part learning model, we do a basic or kihon, we do a, a moving connected um, one that's kino nagari, and then we do what I call kimasubi, which is bringing everything together, tying it like a knot so that everything happens in the now. And that they might speak, they may not speak, they actually try to hit you. And uke is not your friend. So they go from being totally in your, in your court and helping you out to being neutral, to being not friendly. And you do that whole thing every time you do, ideally every time you do an exercise. Okay. Any, Linda. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, I just want to, bring up the idea that this could be used unilaterally. I discovered it. Uh, I discovered an idea very much like what you're doing. Um, when I was training for an exam with uh, very aggressive sword or, you know, Boken strikes and I was doing Tachi Dori, trying to take a Boken that was being swung at my head. And I was just in a place of like, ah, you know, God, stop hitting me. You know, feel, uh, feeling very attacked about it and being reactive. And I finally, after I just wasn't getting it, wasn't getting it, wasn't getting it, I was like, hang on a second. I just went and sat for a second. And I came up with saying to myself, oh, that's my stick. Thank you for bringing it for me. And when it came at me, I was like, Phew. thanks. And it shifted completely how I was. I wasn't jumpy about it. I was like, oh, that's mine. Thank you. It, it took the whole power out of it. Sorry, my cat's attacking my iPad. The, um, the narrative. <laughs> you switched mm -hmm. how the story with which you were approaching it. Exactly, exactly. And, I, and my partner didn't know. What he said was, oh my God, whatever you're doing, keep doing that, you know. <laughs> but yeah. um, but he, yeah, yeah. he I, it wasn't like we were doing it as an exercise together. It was just I had adopted that point of view myself. Yeah. So, you know, even I, if you're not in a dojo culture, and ours is the kind of culture that would explore this sort of thing, but um, but even if you're not, you can do it on your own and nobody has to know. You know, Absolutely. it reminds me of emails. So my wife will get an email and she said, this person says this and she reads it out in a sort of a growly sort of way. And then I said, well, well, maybe they meant it and I'll read it in a much gentler way. And it, it, it's the same point, really. It's, it's how it's received. It's how you, you choose to enter the communication. Yeah, and describing is the window to that for us, for, my, for, my, for me and my students, is that um, when I scream at you, I am very upset. It is entirely your decision whether you would like to also be upset. And so I will, and this, this may seem very basic, but the pull of someone else's psychic state is extremely strong. And if, if I say this person to myself, this person is extremely upset rather than what an asshole. I, I have, it's a completely different deal. This, they're very upset. I, I don't, I don't, if I were to describe myself, I don't, I don't feel very upset. I feel puzzled or like I want to run away or I feel all kinds of different stuff. But if I'm not able to describe what's really going on, I, I don't, I don't know how, how I would navigate. I have to admit that I'm at sea before I can start looking around for landmarks. Very good. 
any more for any more? Uh, Quentin, just a very quick observation. Um, Brandon, what, everything you've said tonight has been absolutely brilliant. I found myself thinking, I think sometimes my, my brain sort of goes off in a slightly tangential way, but I'm not, Alec is a big fan, fan of watching rugby matches. And often I think the New Zealanders are playing or something, they'll get up there and they'll do the haka. And I love watching the haka. And when you were talking about combining the movement with what you're saying and things at the time, I was struck by the, the haka, it looks like a, a kata that is put together to potentially deal with conflict, isn't it? But it includes an awful lot of vocalisation uh, in tandem with the movement. And I never even thought about that you know, b before the things that you were saying tonight. I don't know, do you have any comments on the haka as a traditional form of exercise like this? I don't Abs absolutely, is that we have various rituals that are somatic, that involve all of our mind, body, spirit, soul, and you can expand it, music, rhythm, um, uh, understanding of the other people. There's all kinds of ways that we engage with our environment. And they all communicate something about who we are and what we're doing and where we are. And my question is, what do I want to communicate so that I as observer understand it and so that a literal observer over there understands it? And if I would like that person to not come into my personal space, one of the things, one of the choices I have to do is with my voice and my, my body to, to give them an idea of where my boundary is, right? Stop right there. This is a much clearer message than stop right there. And stop right there is a very different thing. And the haka is, um, it's on. This is battle. This is not a game. <laughs> and, and it's also to say, but this is a very ritualized, formalized, it is not in fact a battle. It is a metaphorical battle. Please acknowledge that what we're doing here is not literally trying to kill each other. And that's part of what humanity's rituals around warfare have been before the industrial era when, when um, humans were imagined as things, as cogs in a military machine that could be destroyed and replaced, warriors have all kinds of, this is not really the ultimate, you have to kill everybody sort of deal. We can walk away from this. It can be bounded by time. We wear special uniforms. We don't kill civilians. We, there's all kinds of rules by which we try to remain as civilized as we can, even under the worst possible decision-making circumstances. And the haka is one of those rituals, because some of the some of the rugby matches are are outright hooliganism. <laughs> yes. And same thing of ice hockey, for instance, is that there's not that understanding that we're all just people. They're they're clobbering each other, and not in a way that's in all sportsmanlike. And they're throwing the rules aside, and that's how they move the ball forward, so to speak. And there's a considerable amount of that in business. And unfortunately, in the recent presidential understanding from the United States, and the sort of all that matters is, did I win? And how I win is I kick your ass. And that's mm -hmm. the only, that's the way it works. And unless you're ready for that, I'm going to roll over. That's not civilization. That's how a, a good place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with, with the haka, thank you very much, Brandon. So with, with the haka, the, the strong feeling always comes across for me is because it's so coordinated. If you take one of them on, you're taking all of them on and they're making that very clear. Yes. Oh, yes. And then they're starting and they're stopping. We can stop. We can start. We are all together. We're extremely fierce. Now let's play ball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes. Let me add our, my thanks from the group to you, Brandon, for sharing. Much appreciated. And I hope it uh, expanded people's thoughts and views a little bit. Uh, and maybe it's something you can take and bring into your, your practice. Uh, and next week, we've got a bit of a UK legend who I'm interviewing, Terry Ezra. Um, Paul, Paul, Paul Linden was really blown away with him by when he met him. Um, he is a bit special on the mat, and he'll have a real story to tell. Um, uh, the week after that, we've got so, a, a friend of mine for, who, who did Aikido up to about Black Belt, who uh, her professionally, she, she writes books on communication, the art of communication. Uh, she writes brilliantly. She, she communicates brilliantly. It's based on neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, it, I, when I attended a, a course by her, I thought, this is Aikido. 
it's Aikido in relationships. I think you're going to love that when that happens. Um, okay, guys. So can we can we have one second to bow out? We can have do that. Yes. Thanks so much.